Hello and welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical trivia and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, why do magpies keep following me around? I've seen at least four of them, just as I've been walking around the streets. They all have worms in their beaks and they all seem to be watching me. Now, being a modern person and an Australian, I know that because it's spring here, the magpies are having babies and need to carry food back to them, which they do by wandering around with worms. They're watching me because they don't want to give away the location of their nest when they drop off the worm, or possibly because Australian magpies are ridiculously belligerent and they're trying to work out if they can drop off the worm and then turn around and attack my head with their razor-sharp beaks. I know this sounds like Australian tail spinning with drop bears and so forth, but I've been attacked by magpies and they've actually drawn blood from my scalp on occasion. Indeed, I think that's probably true of every Australian schoolboy who had a country upbringing. But to a medieval person, seeing magpie after magpie would be taken as a sign. If your character was to see one of these signs, what would they assume is happening? The Christian god doesn't use crows for very much. In some versions of the Noah's Ark story, a raven had his big chance and didn't take it, and so instead, the job of being the great symbol of peace went to a dove. Similarly, the Infernal Powers, although they use crows and ravens because, well, they're spooky, don't seem to use magpies for very much. This leaves us with two realms, magic and fairy. Now, it could just be that your character is being followed round by a Bajorna Magus, that is, a magus that can take the form of a magpie and it's carrying a worm because it wants a snack. In that sense, it's somewhat like the police officers in Hollywood films who sit around in their car with donuts. In which case, why is your character being observed in this way? Have you committed a crime? Has the oracular power of some birds indicated that you are likely to commit a crime? Have you been prejudged and the magpie is just sitting around waiting for you to commit a crime because it's a hoplite in the service of the Quaestoris? Am I pushing this policeman donut metaphor slightly too far? Indeed I am, so let's move on. The Latin name for magpie, pica, comes from the word for word. And it has that name because magpies can speak. That is, they can be trained to parrot words. This is particularly useful if you're a Bajorna Magus, because it means that you don't suffer spell-casting penalties from being unable to talk in your animal form. I was trying to work out who Maggie was. Just to quickly explain, a lot of bird names contain the Christian name of a person that got tacked on as a sort of um, folk tradition during the Middle Ages or later periods. Magpie, for example, is short for Maggie Pie or Margaret Pie, and the bird is called a pie because it's piebald, that is, it's a mixture of white and black feathers. There are several other birds' names that are similar. Robin Redbreast is the obvious example. Also, uh, Jack Daw, Jenny Wren. The birds we now call jays were originally called uh, pies, and they were called jay pies for a while. So, Maggie Pie. I haven't managed to track down who she is. I was hoping it would turn out to be someone very useful, like Marjorie Kemp, say. But this means that this Margaret, since we don't know who she is, could be some sort of primordial spirit. She could be a fairy, or she could be a creature in the Hall of Heroes that manifests in the world through aspects which take the shape of magpies. She's presumably a bit of a gossip, because that's what magpies are known for. I mentioned previously that magpies are slightly oracular, that is... By seeing them, you're meant to be able to predict the future. There are various folk rhymes for this. I'm not certain that any of them go back into the Ars Magica period. One of the earliest versions goes, one for sorrow, two for no, three for a funeral, and four for a birth. The modern version is somewhat longer, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told, eight for a wish, nine for a kiss, ten for a bird you must not miss. Now, the problem with this rhyme, of course, is that the first entry, one for sorrow, is a bad one. Fortunately, the second one, two for joy, is good. And this means that it's important when you meet a magpie in mythic Europe to pretend that there is a second magpie. Uh, this is why it's traditional, even at times in the modern world, for people to hail magpies. To say to the magpie, 
hello mr magpie how's the missus and the point there of course is to suggest that there are two magpies and therefore you will receive joy this is of course a traditional fairy ward it's also traditional amongst british soldiers to salute magpies they by tradition have a rank in the british army in parts of yorkshire this folklore goes even further and the way of avoiding the curse of the magpie is to flap one's arms up and down and make the cries of a magpie therefore indicating that there are two magpies because you yourself are a magpie now there's one additional wrinkle for me which was that i'm an australian and so when i say i've been being followed around by magpies I'm not talking about the creature that the European and American listener may assume. Uh, the common magpie, scientific name Pika Pika, which as a Pokemon player I find hilarious. Sorry, I realise that for the rest of you this is a common name and is perfectly normal. But so many European names sound strange to Australians, you know. Our native animals are called the kangaroo and the emu, which to us sound like perfectly normal words. Your magpies are really called pika pika anyway the creatures which were following me around were probably cracticus tibichen terroregne butcher birds that are pipers that live in queensland terroregne means land of the queen uh, so let's work through that butcher birds get their name from their slightly terrible habit of grabbing their prey and impaling it on trees now, Australians make jokes all the time about how all of our wildlife is deadly, but butcher birds, uh, they get their name from the fact that they hang meat up around the place the way medieval butchers used to do. Sometimes they just impale a whole insect, and sometimes they pull out the organs of their victim and hang the organs up, which is why one of the serial killers in the recent Hannibal series was named the Shrike. A Shrike is another name for a butcher bird because he hung bits of his victims in trees. Now, this can seem slightly morbid, of course, but there's nothing that folklore can't make worse. This could be a simple vis source. For example, um, a Shrike keeps grabbing slightly magical creatures and impaling them on a thorny tree that you can then go and shake for vis. But the part that's most disturbing is, as I've mentioned in some of the previous podcasts, there are human magicians and fairies that can survive with some of their organs separated. It's perfectly possible for you to find a heart, for example, impaled on a tree, and that heart still perfectly functional and belonging to someone who would like it back. I had an idea for an adversarial character who was a magpie queen, a political character or an adventuress who controlled many men by granting them the virtue that allowed the removal of their hearts and then removing the hearts and placing them in a tree so that, in a sense, their hearts belonged to her. The characters can't simply destroy her with a ball of abysmal flame because her death would lead to the end of the grant of the virtue, which would mean that her male victims would all just fall dead the characters would need to find a way of incapacitating her long enough to place the hearts back in the victims. Or, of course, they could ignore this more moral of approaches and simply harvest the hearts for corpus viz. That being said, what happens if they put the wrong hearts in the wrong people? Does this allow a transfer of passions? Does it allow an elderly character to act like a young man again? We're trying to work out how you would incapacitate this magpie queen let's call her margaret because we have that name available i thought that one way of incapacitating her would be to use another weakness of magpies in folklore which is that they collect shiny objects perhaps you could trap her with mirrors or maybe like certain types of vampire she can be incapacitated by being encircled with dozens of tiny objects in this case bright shiny ones that she needs to pick up. The broader point I'm trying to make in this podcast has very little to do with magpies or with worms. It's that medieval people had a way of looking at the world. The world was a story in which messages were being sent to them by the divine through a process of revealed significatos. Uh, significatos are the meanings behind objects in creation. If you're looking at the world with a similar mindset, you can create stories 
out of the most trivial of occurrences, like being followed around by magpies. When you're trying to flesh out these stories, it's helpful to have things like Brewer's Phrase and Fable or the etymologies of names to assist you. But the key point is that mindset, that life is narrative, that you are living a story, and that an exterior author is sending you clues through trivial occurrences. Now, I'm not wanting to delve into matters of real-life faith here. What I'm suggesting is that as a story guide, there is an enormous untapped well of available stories in everyday trivial occurrences.